you have a whole lot more to process. So, um, um, what, do you have a preference? Is there is there a hybrid option? I'm not for me going. I like to get more new information. That's, All right. my, man, that's my man. So. Yeah, and we can we can hybrid it because can we could we do that a little bit? Yes. Can we say 15 or 20 minutes at the end or something? Yeah, or just weave it in. Yeah. You know, okay. because what I'm about to do is um, uh, what I'm about to do is probably take everything you've been hearing and I'm going to jack it up and I'm going to slide um, major theological realities underneath it and settle it back down. Um, have you ever relayed a foundation of a house that already exists? Uh, okay. It's a pretty, it's a pretty traumatic thing. You literally jack up the house. They're actually building blocks. And you hear the whole thing. Oh, it's a terrifying sound. I mean, you just think, I've just ruined the whole building. Um, it's, and uh, I don't want to try and do that. And I'll, and I'll explain why. But first, let's pray. Father, we are about to talk about things so enormous, so expensive that they, uh, they, they do border on such magnificence that we're dwarfed in their presence. Mm -hmm. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that as we touch these glorious truths revealed in your word, we would do so with appropriate humility and anticipation that you would use them for our own being. My brothers may well have thought these things through. If so, please cause our percolating on the truth once considered to cause the broth to become all the more rich. Please help us, we pray, through Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, I want to begin by telling you I had a statement made by Dr. Cornelius Van Til when I was at Westminster that was a life changer. And it was one of those, I don't know if you've yet had this experience where you read a book, you hear a lesson, you heard a sermon and there's a line or there's something in it and it happens and the whole rest of the lecture, the book, the sermon just goes like into a fog. Because <laughs> all you can do is think about that last statement. Mm -hmm. This was the statement Dr. Van Til made. If you've ever heard of Dr. Van Til, he was the upcoming author of presuppositional apologetics, but he said this, all truth is the externalization of the personality of the Trinity. He made that statement, and you know, he put it out in the air, he just went right on, and my brain went, okay, that's really big. All truth, all truth. I want to go to that reality. Can you say that one more time? All truth is the externalization of the personality of the Trinity. Here's what I'm going to try and get at and show you why so much of what you've been learning, discussing, and finding out is so important. <clears throat> Let's go back to um, what was the first thing that God did not like in all of creation? Man being alone. Say it again? Man being alone. And why did he not like him? Because it was not good. And why was it not good? This is a prototype. Because, because God was not alone. Mm -hmm. Very important. Sorry. Mm -hmm. God was not alone. He is the only being mm -hmm. made in the image of God yeah. who has never been alone. Mm -hmm. So here's Adam. And we're going to put him now in context. This is the one. This side is um, uncreated. On this side is created. And please listen ever so carefully. On the uncreated side, it's not good for him to be alone because he's the only being made in the image of a God who's never been alone. Every time God made something else, he said, let there be, let there be, let there be. But when he made Adam, what did he say? Let us make man in our image. Who to us? Who's the us? 
Who is it? The Trinity. Trinity. Okay. Now, please note, God is very particular about his names. He made one of his Ten Commandments. Do not misuse my names. And please note, nobody chose to name him anything. He chose all of his names. Most of his names have to do with something that's already been created. Like Jehovah Rophe, the Lord heals and implies somebody's sick. And he will heal you. Jehovah said it came to the Lord is our righteousness, implies somebody's unrighteousness, he'll provide the righteousness. Jehovah Jireh, somebody lacks something, he'll provide it. But before anything existed, this is what he chose to call himself. Please note this about the names. They are not ecclesiastical names. It is not priest and congregant in the Holy Spirit. Hmm. They are not economic names, boss and employee in the Holy Spirit. They're not military names, general and private. They're not um, regal, king and vassal. They're familial. Hmm. Before anything existed, before there was anything, there was a familial fabric to the nature of the triune God. Now let me go this far. If these are names that God has had upon himself for all eternity, if he chooses to hang <coughs> his names anywhere on this side of creation, how important do you reckon it will be? <laughs> If he lets a human bear this name, Father. If he lets a human bear this name, this gets to some of why your heart is hurting. Parent, yeah. child. If he puts these into time and space, how big are these concepts? How enormous will their influence be? How untold will the weight of trafficking in these realities be? Off the charts, immeasurable, glorious, magnificent, and if twisted, if twisted, how aberrant will the implications be? How painful will the results be? Am I making myself clear? Okay. So he makes a man says, it's not good for you to be alone because I've never been alone. Now. What did he do next? Next thing he did after he said, yeah, 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 yes, yeah. he brought all the animals to him, mm -hmm. and he said, and whatever Adam named him, that was its name. That makes this wonderful statement, but no suitable helper for Adam was found. Mm -hmm. Question, was that a shock to God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. You're so bad. Exactly. It wasn't like he's going, Adam, I thought I put it here. <laughs> Did you not see that? You know, it is entirely to show Adam. Here's what I think you can basically see that God is saying. And it's not, this is part of the reason I believe in inerrancy and infallibility. Moses wasn't smart enough to write this. <laughs> He's saying, Adam, do not look for it anywhere in creation. Don't look for it in nature. Don't look for it in work. Don't look for it in rest. Don't look for it in the beauty of a sunrise. Don't look for it in the magnificent of watching a lion tear across the um, grass signs. Don't look for it. It won't be there. Loneliness will eat you alive unless I give you what you need. Now, go to sleep. First anesthetic surgery. Out of what did God make Adam? Dust. Out of what did God make Eve? Adam. Why? Of the same nature. And why is that important? It reflects the Trinity. Bingo. He he's could have said, Adam, I made you out of the dirt. I'm going to make her out of the dirt. But he didn't. There to reflect a being that is more than one person, but one. More than one person, but one. Same essence, but 
different persons. And then he wakes Adam up, and don't miss this, <laughs> he wakes Adam up, and what is the first art in the Bible? Poetry. Mm -hmm. And is it vertical toward God or no. horizontal towards no. God? No. Don't miss that. Mm -hmm. And God didn't say, you twit! It should have been a hand toward me. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. And he says, it's good when Adam looks at her and goes, bone of my bone <laughs> and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. The first art is horizontal. Mm -hmm. It's not vertical. Mm -hmm. And God's pleased with it. Yeah. Now what's the first command that God gave Adam? Be fruitful. Very right. Mm -hmm. Here would be a way of paraphrasing. Adam, Eve, I want my earth filled with God lovers. Mm -hmm. Now, I could do it. I made you both. I don't want to do it alone. Mm -hmm. You're in my image. You do it. You fill the earth with God lovers. Adam, now before I go to this next part, what was pre-fall evangelism? How did you make another God lover? You made a baby. Sexual relations was evangelism. <laughs> Don't miss that. <laughs> because if you want to understand circumcision, you have to understand that. <laughs> we'll come back to that. So he says, okay, Adam, Eve, I'm going to fill the earth with God lovers because you are in my image. Now here's the plan. Adam, have you noticed that she's concave where you're convex? Have you noticed I've made your body so it'll fit? So here's the way you make a God lover. Be the most like me you can be. More than one person. One. Guys, I've made it so the line between you is going to blur. Mm -hmm. The emotional sensation is going to be so extreme that the line between tears and joy is going to blur. I'm going to make a really strong statement. If you would like to know what I think Jesus meant in John 17 when he said, Father, may they be one as you and I are one, that their joy may be full. If you were to take the sweetest, most glorious moment of intimacy between a husband and wife, improve it by infinity and stretch it out over eternity, you'd have an understanding of what God feels like on the inside. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, I want you to know what it's like in here. So, make another God lover. Now, let's just pause a minute and touch on some things. Do you start to see why sexuality is so important to God? Mm -hmm. Do you start to see why teaching children this do not have sexual relations before coming? Why? Because God says not to? But why does he say not to? Not simply because he's saying, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, I want your life not to be fun. He's saying, I've given you an experience that is meant to give you a winter, listen, a window into intra-Trinitarian bliss. And inside of me, two things are read. Covenant, faithful, covenant faithfulness. And unparalleled unifying intimacy, the likes of which you will be nothing but a dim reflection. And both of these are in me. And any time you separate these, you're saying a lie about whom? God. That's it. When you live as a human contrary to the personality of the Trinity, you are committing character assassination. Mm -hmm. You are slandering about the nature of the universe. Mm -hmm. You are taking, it's like holding the face of another person and screaming heresy in their face. It's making sense? This is why divorce, even though one out of every two marriages is coming to a close, mm -hmm. we can't just say, it's almost the majority, so let's just live with it. 
Why are kids who come to your youth group still crawling on hands and knees in agony because their parents have split up, even though all their friends have the same experience? Mm -hmm. Because the damage is cosmic. It's deeper than their DNA. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way down to the Imago Dei. Why is sex so important to God? Because it goes deeper than your DNA. It goes all the way down to the Imago Dei. Mm -hmm. Why is it essential that relationship in youth ministry is so central? Mm -hmm. Because you are reflecting the image of a relational God. You can't turn it off. I mean, we can keep going, but let's just pause because you want to ask a question. Well, yeah, I just had to say, thinking about that, you know, and I'll just share something personal here. Um, one of the most amazing things that happened in my first year and a half of marriage was one, one evening after my wife and I had been intimate, out of my mouth came the words, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I just thought about that. It was intuitive. It was intu absolutely. It was absolutely intuitive of what what that relationship is all about and how much a reflection it is of the nature of God. So you you got it. So basically, what you're seeing is this relationship, not alone, but more than any other, is a reflection of this. Mm -hmm. Now you see why covenant youth ministry is so important and why you heard how essential it is that you not replace mothers and fathers even when they fail, mm -hmm. but press the kids toward them. Why you equip mothers and fathers to be mothers and fathers. Because their relationship becomes such paradigm forming for kids. It's why it's so Potent. It's why it's also why ministry works best relationally. I mean, why can't we just be conceptual automatons? You know, and just give truth. This is very Aristotelian, and frankly, in my humble opinion, the Reformed tradition has been more Aristotelian than biblical. Aristotle believed truth was inherently good, people were inherently good, and if you gave inherently good truth to inherently good people, you were done. Wrong. Truth is inherently good, people are not inherently good, and the manner in which truth is most imparted is the same way as the relational dynamic inside the Trinity, which is now also imprinted on them deeper than their DNA, so you must communicate with them relationally. Ding, 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 ding. Let's begin to see. You're, you're not being taught to be caring and spending time with the students because it works. It works because you're made in the image of God. Amen. And you Amen. cannot turn that off in you or in them. And you must honor that and act in accord with the Imago Day and the day of the Imago. Amen. So that the kids become, that your methodology matches the message that you are embodying and proclaiming. Is this review or is this new? Review with a nice twist. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> sort of new, but not to the fullness. Okay, let's go even further. Are you all married? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now I'm just going to talk to you about your marriages for a moment. Uh, this is going to get really strong. I believe inside your marriages, you are tasting not just the communicable attributes of God, but the non communicable Mm. Now there's two, two attributes. The communicable are those attributes that God has and we have. He thinks, we think. He creates, we create. Those are attributes that are communicated to us. The non-communicable attributes are the omnis. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Now think of it. I want you to think about how powerful now, clearly you're not omnipotent in your wife's life, nor she in yours, but I want you to realize how much power there is in your relationship. If you both come into a room, let's say one of you comes through that door and one of you comes through this door, and you've not seen each other all day, 
and you both come in the room and you simply do not make eye contact, how many minutes or seconds will have to pass while you're both in the same room before one or both of you goes, something's wrong. Just because mm -hmm. you don't move two one-inch circular orbs in the center of your head in the direction, how long would it take before you'd feel, ooh, pain? About two seconds tops. Seconds, yeah. yeah. If the two of you are in the same room and there's no connection, the sense of the power of the lack of eye contact is felt instantly. Here's the thing you need to see with that. All you have to do to hurt your wife is nothing. Mm -hmm. So true. Just let it settle. You have so much power that all you have to do is nothing. But the converse is true. You could have an absolutely aberrant day where the fall is tearing apart everything. <laughs> you know, you don't feel like you're getting through the kids, the parents don't understand you, you've been accused of this, you've been mistreated, uh, and, you know, the car's broken down, the phone system's not working, the computer crashed. I mean, it is just, <laughs> you feel like you are, your office is on the suburbs of hell. <laughs> walks into the office and she just touches your face with her hand and just says, I love you, we'll get through it. She can cancel it day. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't do that in your life. <laughs> <laughs> John Piper doesn't have that power. Peter Ferguson doesn't have that power. There's only one person on the planet that has that power. I bet you wish you, you had it this week. You're right? <laughs> coming up, you'll be able to say, it'll be okay. Yeah. You're watching this. <laughs> Guys, that's, you're tasting omnipotence. Mm -hmm. You're also tasting omnipresence. You now know what it's like mm -hmm. to have someone who's always there. Mm -hmm. And when it's really, really good in your life, like if this week was really, really good, don't you find yourself saying, I just wish. What? Oh, I'm here. here. And if it's really awful, I just gotta call my wife. <laughs> you have the blessing, and listen, it's only because you're sinners, only because you're sinners, that sometimes you're gonna say to yourself, oh, she's always there. That's only because you're a sinner. Hmm. Third, omniscience. You know things about one another that nobody else knows. You can play each other like a harmonica for destructive purposes where you can build each other up and thrust the other toward Christ by your words and deeds. You're tasting it. Now go another step to kids. I believe you're teaching theology, the character of the Trinity, to infants 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. 365 days a year. If a child, so Adam and Eve, um, you know, they, they make a God lover, here we go. It's so warm. I really love it. 
And then I get this messy, oh, it is just, <laughs> it is everywhere, and it just, oh, I can't scare. They take it away. Mm -hmm. They just take it away. Mm -hmm. The child's learning um, in presence and omnipotence. Have you ever seen in your nursery at your church? It, it wouldn't matter if you had the most brilliant child psychologist working in the nursery. The children, as they get older and are toddlers, they don't feel like anyone has the power but mom and dad. Mm -hmm. right. Have you ever been in a mall when a little kid thinks you're their dad and they grab your leg and they yeah. hook up your leg and see you and they're like, ah! Because you don't have the power. Right. I can remember the first time my son had a wound I couldn't kiss away. He put his hand right on a wood burning stove. Ooh. And of course, the blisters were instantaneous. And ah. came to me and just, I believe you're kissing. And I didn't even want to kiss the hand because the blisters were always so I kissed his wrist. He went, do it again. Because it didn't work. It was the first time. Mm -hmm. He faced the fact I didn't have mm -hmm. all the power. That's so huge, too, that, I mean, there's so many different infant raising models out there, it's not morally neutral. No, it isn't. I mean, what we do with our babies and encourage our parents to do with their babies has long-lasting consequences. It does. You're going down a path about certain things that are taught about, well, I'm not going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to just get on to other things. I want you to see the tremendous role that you play in teaching theology. In fact, this is why I'm a Calvinist. Mm -hmm. More than Calvinist. It's raising a child. Mm -hmm. There are two ways you can raise a child, basically. I love you. I want to be a part of your life. I, I'm trying to be a good parent. I want to be here, but it's up to you to trust me. If, if you trust me and really trust that I do love you and you, and you yield to me, everything's going to be great. But if you don't, it's just not going to be good. And it won't be my fault. It'll be yours. That's one way to raise it. Here's the other way. I did this with all three of my children. I put them on my knee and I said, my daughter's 22. She was the youngest. And I said, Ellie, if you tell a lie, well, I still love you. And she said, Mm -hmm. You're right. I said, Ellie, if you run away, well, I still love you. And she paused and I. Mm -hmm. You're right. If you rob the bank and kill all the guards, will I still love you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, Yes, I will. I said, You see, Ellie, I will still love you even if you do something wrong because you're my girl, not because of you, but because you're your mom and me. We made you. And since we made you and started this relationship, you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. We're going to be there for you all the time. <clears throat> Do you think she went, I don't like this doctrine, it's cold, and it voids my will, and I just want to complain. <laughs> <laughs> for you to think she hugged me. Mm -hmm. All three of my kids hugged me. Every human on the planet wants that. Mm -hmm. They can't turn it off. Calvinism is woven into the fabric of the universe. And when you teach this to your kids, you are rewriting the truth of the story of the universe and telling them there is one who loves this way, and his name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. The power of Calvinism is not simply a theological position for which we argue against Arminianism. It is the meaning of the universe. That's part of what is inside of the Trinity. Now, here we go. Sin now hits. Let me know. Now, when Adam and Eve have babies, are they going to grow up God lovers? No. In fact, I guess timeline in that lightning bolt ought to be right here. Because <laughs> it preceded the first child. Now, now kids won't grow up loving God. So, has God voided the use of the family? Is now everything changed? No. In fact, he intensifies it. Rather than demeaning it or reducing it, this is why covenant 
ministry is so important. He intensifies it and he adds an incredibly essential uh, dimension to it. Now we'll come up to Abraham and Sarah. What was the sign of God's covenant when he said to Abraham, you will be not the missionary of many nations, not the pastor of many nations, not the priest of many nations, father, don't miss, <laughs> don't miss. He's saying, as my world is healed and changed, it will be because you act like me. So when we do sterile, distant, uninvolved, I'll only be in your life if your responsive ministry is heresy. It's heresy being taught by the way we're moving in ministry. It's character assassination. Okay, so and what's the sign of this covenant? Circumcision. Circumcision. Now, if you go to Colossians 2, okay, that's Genesis 17. If you go to Colossians 2, 9 and following, do you remember what he calls the cross? The circumcision not done by human hands. So here's what God is saying to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, I am still wanting to change my world familially. And Abraham, you must see yourself as Abraham, no longer great father, but father of great numbers. I want you to define yourself in terms of your familial relationship with every tribe and tongue. I want you to be a people on this earth that think familially when they look at the Medes and the Persians and the Edomites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites. That's you. That's you, Abraham. Out of the one scary call. I mean, that's what we were hearing about this morning. To have missionary zeal that's found in what will come in glory so that you can be the lover of people that nobody wants to love at all. But there's a sign that I will be behind this great work because 12 times in Genesis 17, God says, I will, I will, I will, you will, you will, you will, I will, I will, they will, they will. It's basically God saying, you won't, you won't, you can't. I got it. I got it. And the sign of circumcision, in essence, he's saying everything is as it was here. But now kids don't grow up loving me unless there's the shedding of blood for sin. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to ever change a diaper without thinking about the gospel. Mm -hmm. I don't want you kids ever go to the bathroom without thinking about the gospel. I don't want you to ever have an intimate moment with your wife again without thinking about the gospel. I don't want you to ever kiss your wife again without thinking about the gospel. I don't want you to ever have a kid without thinking about the gospel. Will you cut a man there and remember anything you tell him? <laughs> Where did he say to put the law to the people of Israel? in their homes. He said, nail it to the doorpost. It's called a mezuzah. Mm -hmm. Where do you say to put the gospel? Cut it in your flesh. Mm. Man. How important do you figure he wants us to remember the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel? It's pretty simple. <laughs> he wants us tattooed with truth. So that we will teach it, model it, embody it, and always look at our kids cross-eyed. You should never look at a student or your own children any way but cross-eyed. Put another way. Mm -hmm. Don't do what I did. I raised three kids and I asked all three of them to leave the room. And I brought them back in one at a time and I said, Matthew, what is the most important thing I've taught you as your dad? What's the big lesson of my life to you? Always do the right thing, Dad. Andrew came in and said the exact same thing. Ellie came in and said, J. 
Jesus loves me. Yeah. So I raised two Pharisees and one Christian. Now they all three became believers, but I was a better parent to my third child. Keep the gospel central as a dad, keep the gospel central as somebody who's teaching and never a good student without being cross eyed. You see what I meant when I said I'm going to jack up everything you've been studying? <laughs> And I'm going to take the Trinity and slide it underneath and say, okay, now lower it back down. The things you're being taught are not just neat ideas. Mm -hmm. You are being asked methodologically to embody the nature of the God who has commanded these things to be proclaimed in the earth by thought, word, and deed. In private with your wife and children and in public in your youth ministry. You're being taught to do this so that you don't spout heresy by your manner, though you may be proclaiming orthodoxy with your mouth. So that the consistency between the two, which may not exist at home, but at least exist in you, and they'll find a reference point that keeps a setting before them the model of lifting up the Trinity by magnifying the family and magnifying sexuality in appropriate ways and modeling it before them so that they begin to learn massive theological truth of the consistency of the relationships of the people around them. Mm -hmm. now, I can keep spitting this out, but let's just pause. Give me some feedback. Is this still review or is this taking it even further? It's, it's going further. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's mind-blowing to me how much power we have and sobering to think of what we're really messing with in a sense. You know what I mean? I'm just like I'm, I'm going, okay, I'm afraid to go out of the room now. Let me say, I agree. I'm not. <laughs> I mean, we'll go ahead. You think about it. Help me. If I were running the universe, I would have never delegated this out, okay? I would have just said, I'm keeping this up here. And I know you guys, I have seen what you can do. But it's also a testimony to a sovereignty. But this gets back to my second message. When I said, what makes you spiritually great? Absolute consistency, absolute accuracy, always preventing sin, always progressing? No. It's when these things, which are so important, the smallest thing of being inconsistent in relationship with people matters. And you come and say, I am so sorry that I've not modeled this to you. And they're looking at you like, what? I said, look, it does matter. It does. Because Jesus said it should. It's not, it's not perfection. It's repentance. Or who could do this? That's why that chapter is so liberating. Mm -hmm. Finally, I can be a failure <laughs> and be faithful and do good yeah. and be in the earth and accomplish good. Mm -hmm. But it, is, it explains why sorrows are so deep when relationships like this are breached and broken. Yeah. It explains why fruit is so powerful when these things are present even though they may not know the Bible very well. It explains why when they do know the Bible, parents that is, and they don't live consistent with it, it just <laughs> so throws the kids when they get Bible verses went to lies that are domineering or manipulative or abusive. They're just like, what? You know, it just, it, it's just like really spinning them and you start to see how important this whole idea of covenant family is. Joey showed you by covenants, but watch how central the family is when you go through the whole Bible. Um, how is Israel supposed to come into the land? Originally? When they came into the land, how were they to organize? The tribes. What's a tribe? Why are there so many genealogies in the Bible? <laughs> Family. Why is true religion watching after widows and orphans in their distress? <laughs> Family. 
Why does the end of the Old Testament come with these words? And God will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Mm -hmm. Why is salvation called adoption? Mm -hmm. Why do we call each other brother? Why is the grounds for being a teaching elder not what seminar I went to, but how I treat my family? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I can keep going. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get less important. Mm -hmm. It gets more. And you start to see why the centrality of marking the kids with a covenant is so important. Mm -hmm. What you're doing in a baptism, it, you know, remember when Joey drew this diagram? <coughs> We've all been through year one. Do you remember when we drew this? Mm -hmm. Old Testament, New Testament, you know, Passover and circumcision point this way. Lord's Supper and baptism point this way. The blood stops here. Because mm -hmm. yeah. the real blood was shed. Mm -hmm. But the important message is no less important. It's more important. Because we're living post-cross. So unless my Baptist friends can somehow show me that God phased out the family, right. I don't have the burden of proof. Mm -hmm. They do. See what I'm saying? Right. These have theological, sacramental implications, all coming back to, just like Van Til said, all truth mm -hmm. is the externalization of the personality of the Trinity. And the more I've just cogitated on that and simmered on it, think about roles of headship and why the role did thing with women and men which is getting really, in the PCA, you're, if you're like me, you're, you know, you're starting to feel like, okay, we're the last one standing, <laughs> we're holding this one up. In, in 1 Corinthians, it puts it quite simply. In 1, you know, nobody wants to talk about this passage because it includes head, head covering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, 1 Corinthians 11. Now I want you to realize the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And he goes on head coverings. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Here's what's happening there. He's saying, as the Father is to the Son, so the man is to the woman. God is saying, I want the business card of my character my intra-Trinitarian relationship portrayed in the, excuse me, the church and the home. Mm -hmm. These are the two places it's commanded. I want people to understand. Now, he says elsewhere, of course, in Ephesians 5, that the husband is to be the head of the household until he and the woman is to submit. As soon as you say these two words, lead and submit, your mind thinks analogically outside of the Trinity. Wrong. Mm. Wrong. When God paints that picture from eternity past, the analogy, the methodology, the foundation is not boss, employee, coach, right. player, teacher, student. It's nothing created. It's Him. Now listen to Philippians 2 where the roles are spun out. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself and became obedient, obedient as a servant, even a servant unto death, even death on the cross. <coughs> Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Can you follow me? What does that last section say God is doing with all of history, designing all of history, every knee, every bow, to bow before whom? Him or the Son? The Son. Now go back to 1 Corinthians 11. Mm -hmm. If you are to reflect the head, the Father, to the Son, what if from this point on you lead this way? Mm -hmm. I'm going to adjust all of life, so all the honor, to her. Mm. 
Let me prove to you how central that is to the Trinity. The Trinity shows up twice in the New Testament, and the Trinity says the same thing twice. This is my beloved Son. I'm well pleased. And at the Transfiguration, God adds one more phrase. What is it? Listen to Him. Now you almost want to say, look, if you're only going to show up twice, say something different. <laughs> <laughs> but He's only got one message. What if every time you're in public, your message is not, I've been to seminary, listen to me. Your message is, this is my beloved wife. I cannot tell you how pleased I am that she said yes. <laughs> you all want to listen. How hard is it for that woman to submit to you? <laughs> <laughs> Strawberry, you see what I mean? But you say lead to an American man, and you're going to confuse that fellow mm -hmm. big time if you don't factor in the Trinity. Right. And then how is she to submit? First part of Philippians 2. Even with this, how hard was it for Jesus? Made them sweat blood. Mm. But how high a calling is it for the wife to say, my job? is to show my children the Savior. Holy cow, holy. <laughs> That's it. This is, this is how you eke out what it means to lead and submit. Is it's rooted in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. This is how pastors are supposed to lead. This is the primary way of relating, husband and wife, but not the exclusive way of relating. This is the primary way of leading, and submitting, but not the exclusive way of leading and submitting. And if the business card is to be in both the home and the church, how should an elder lead? How should the women in the church feel by the way men honor them? Mm -hmm. It ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> They're not feeling like you're really heard and listened to. See what I'm saying? These are big things, and again, I, I could, we could just keep going. You can say, well, basically, every young married couple ought to do nothing more than imitate the Trinity. You know, that's, if, if you just do that, we're done in marriage counseling. <laughs> that's all you're going to do is copy the Trinity. And it just, think about creation. Um, God is omniscient. All the persons of the Trinity know everything at all the time, but they talk to one another. Mm -hmm. We have what a lot of men think is unnecessary communication. Well, you, <laughs> you know that. Uh -huh. But they're saying, let us make man in our image. Well, they won't know they're going to do that. Yet they're talking. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, quote, well, I already told you last week, or instead of talking, 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 shared ministry, let us. Let what comes from us, anything that we create, ought to reflect us, our home, our world. Our kids ought to see us working in tandem. They ought to feel this unity from us. I mean, it just goes out like crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop. Give me some reaction. How would you apply it? Um, is this just abstract, or is it concrete enough to, to get down to where you're thinking, living, and ministering? I've done very little work or time thinking about that. Probably, new, I feel like it's probably newer to me than maybe than anybody in here. Um, and I guess it gives. It feels like it is, I don't know, it feels like it really, um, I'm struggling for the words to, to use, but um, I think it is the beginning of tasting that God's truth is really transformative. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, You're feeling what I thought of Van Til said that phrase. Mm -hmm. You're feeling sexy, and I just, I just, it almost made me fall back over the front chair. <laughs> yes, yeah. we said that first. Mm -hmm. One, it, it makes, 
I guess he's been in a, I guess he's been in maternity figuring really figuring figuring that out and you never you never end but if everything is constantly if the quote you gave us it, you know if that's really true then there's just so much work yeah. and prayer to do working out the implications of the unlimited number of connections mm -hmm. and their the way they flush where the way I guess truth is flushing itself out. Yeah. And I feel the same way. I just um, I feel like I've been spending my life since that lecture thinking of different ways and I'll read something and go, there's another. Yeah. <laughs> there it is again. You you heard that with from Van Tell for yeah. first that's that was your first yeah. never never thought that way. And I heard a PCA teaching elder named Buck Hatch teach on marriage using the Trinity and it went three D. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and someone else has seen it. What are other, um, how do you grow or strengthen or reinforce that in your, in your life? Who, who, what's, what's to be done or who, who should you read or how, I mean. It's a very good question. I don't know that I've found a single repository mm -hmm. of people that have sort of spun it out. Yeah. Um, I'd recommend Gospel Powered Parenting by William Farley. He, he really digs into the Trinity, especially Christ, mm -hmm. and, and the role of the father and husband in the home. Mm -hmm. it, it just pierces to the heart. Mm -hmm. Gospel Power of Parenting by him? William Farley. Is that a book or a series or what? It's a it? book. Yeah. Perry? Yeah, it's, it, you do have to marinate in this. You don't. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's not a 20 minute exercise. Mm -hmm. You spend your life cooking on this one. Yeah. Okay, before you leave the ministry or anything, I mean, like before you retire or before you leave this earth, you need to write the book. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I've learned that writing is a different gift than talking. <laughs> um, and some people have it. Like Sean Larue, he has both gifts. I don't got both gifts. I, I worked on one chapter for a book on preaching. My secretary, after I think it was like the 15th draft, said, Don't ever do this again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Yeah, this is not my gift. Yeah, yeah and this also reflects you know, what Schaefer said that we either begin with a personal first cause or an impersonal first yeah. cause. Yeah. And once you start, start with defines everything else. Mm -hmm. That the personality and character of God affects everything. Mm -hmm. not everything flows out of. Him. And, you know, and I've, I've talked to some of the folks in our church, too, and, um, and my wife, that it's so easy for us to get so caught up into, in theology and reform circles that we miss the character of God for the theology of God. That we, we completely miss what justification, sanctification, and glorification tell us about the personhood of the, the passions, the love, the character of God. Yeah, the um, that's why I think this is so helpful. Because mm -hmm. it's because it's all it's all reinforcing yeah. the the relation the relationship that you were mm -hmm. that was initiated, and you can. I don't know. There's so many different ways, I guess, to work out understanding that and. Parent relationships and ministry relationships and relationship you know, for just relationship all around us and even with nature. Yeah. Um, R. B. Kuyper taught practical theology in Westminster Seminary in his early years, and he said, "Doctrine is like a window through which you look at a vista of like the Alps. Mm -hmm. No one." Who has a window that overlooks the Alps? No one has ever come up to the window and gone, "Look at that glass." <laughs> <laughs> never happens. They always, oh, what a view of the Alps. Mm -hmm. The truth is meant for God to show you Himself. Now, let me show you how this has implications in evangelism and apologetics. Mm -hmm. it, it is very important to note that the Trinity is a very sensitive issue with the Islamic world. It's probably the most painfully contrary
doctrine you can bring up to them. Don't bring it up on the first visit. Hmm. But note this, they also believe that Allah, the One, is eternal. So let me ask you a question. If a being like Allah doesn't exist, but if he did, was in fact eternal, remember, eternity goes in both directions, to the future and to the past. So forgive me for this oxymoron, but for most of eternity, who was Allah loving? No one. What does Allah have to do to love? Create. Because he's one. So he has to create humans. So what that means is, for Allah, loving is something he chose to do. Now go to the Trinity. How long has the Father loved the Son? How long has the Son, the Spirit, the Father, been in this huge glory exchange of love? Now do you see why John says, God is love, mm -hmm. not loving. Right. It, it is his character. Mm -hmm. It isn't something he does. It's him. <laughs> it's also why it speaks of this huge glory exchange inside. It's why the expression of Adam to Eve artistically was not an offense to God. <laughs> you are like me. Mm -hmm. You love her, don't you? <laughs> I love inside me too. Mm -hmm. I made her pretty good, didn't I? <laughs> and you're like me. Give her glory. The Son glorifies me. I glorify Him. We glorify the Spirit. Get this idea of glory exchange. It's, it's man, just wow. You start to understand why a kid, when I'm, I'm really dating myself, do you remember when the United States? beat Moscow on hockey? Yeah. Do you remember the picture of the guy in the, I guess it was the 70s or 80s, with the American flag draped over the goalie, looking into the stands, mouthing, where's my dad? Where's my dad? Hmm. The whole world is applauding this guy. And he cares about one person to share the glory. Where's my dad? Mm -hmm. And when your kid does a good thing, it doesn't matter if the world applauds. Mm -hmm. It's you. Because you're in the glory exchange with your boy or your girl. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's your attaboy that matters. That makes sense? Yeah. I mean, he, you're right. This, this, the more you think, we go pan till. Bingo! This is like E equals MC squared yes. in theology. You know, it's yeah. <laughs> just, boy. It's, Good. I just wanted to, I remember reading, you were talking about trade of life, and I think all, that all comes back to this. Yeah, it does, it does, yes. And even non-Christians, because I remember, I don't know if you recall back when the men's thing, you know, the reaction sort of to the, the feminization yes. of men in America and the guy, I don't remember his name, wrote Iron John. Do you remember that book? Yes. I remember re reading that, and he says in that book, the thing that's what stopped me because it so resonated with me, because what I want to be is I feel so inadequate. And he said, We want life to come out of our hands. Mm. We want to be life givers mm. as men. Mm. You know, and I thought, man, this is this is all over the fabric. That's what, that's what he's saying. And this, there's, a, there's a doctrine called the aseity of God, which nobody talks about anymore. The doctrine of the aseity of God is he's entirely self-contained. Mm -hmm. He has no needs. He has wants, but he has no needs. Mm -hmm. And God's wants are pretty important <laughs> because they are selected by him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, they are, yeah, oh my God. This is probably not the right phrase to use, they're options. You know, they're not necessities, they are things that he chooses. He chooses to give life to something outside of himself. That's his choice. He didn't have to. He doesn't have this need. Right. Mm -hmm. But he wants to do that. That's why you want to do. Mm -hmm. That's why it's inside of you. You want for your life 
to have a noble influence on this person's right. life. Mm -hmm. um, your desires are rooted in the Trinity. Your hopes are rooted in the Trinity. Your dreams are rooted in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And we're almost at 2 30, so. So I'm still going to ask my same question again <coughs> for a second time. How do you how do you marry and grow in that? <laughs> Pray. When you go through the Bible, look for the way the Trinity shows up. Like you do for Christ in the sermon. Mm -hmm. Notice how important it is to Paul, how he brackets for every epistle with the Trinity, the Trinity, mm -hmm. the Trinity, the Trinity, the Trinity, the Trinity. <coughs> you know, we do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the book ends almost everything, all the theology he teaches with this. Because yeah. it seems like it's so intensely, intensely practical as well. Like yeah. it's, it's, immediate, it's immediately making sense of, of a trillion different things that are, are, are all taking place at once that are not just happening because, mm -hmm. like you said, with why do we do youth? Why is relational youth ministry? I mean, why do kids start showing up in youth group when I take them out during the week and when I hang out at their house and when I go to the ball games? Because they do. And why is that? It's much better to, to have an understanding of how that's rooted in the Trinity than for me to than for me to build my ministry around one well, more kids show up because it's just so shallow and I can get discouraged and quit. Mm, but so if, you know, but if it's rooted in in the representation of, yeah, of, of the Trinity and, and the trickle down and the flow, it's so, it's so hot, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's just, it just burns. Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah. It's when you hear the words that you were taught this week, and when you heard me 100 of you were talking, is when you heard that we really believe that God is at work. Mm -hmm. We believe in, we believe in providence. And he is doing what he wants to do to give glory to whom? himself. Mm -hmm. So he is doing this to reflect who he is. Mm -hmm. And so he is at work through your ministry so that students will understand him. And for some of us, um, he, there are people that are so damaged that they need more time with fewer people so that they learn it. Mm -hmm. Now in the Church of America economy, that means you're not as successful as the guy who has been called to show that to many kids. Perhaps the wounds of heretical distortion of home and life are not as intense in those kids. But he's given you a ministry to the Philistines. Mm -hmm. You don't know. And the standards of why God does what he does in providence through us are far more nuanced and complex yeah. than one's a success and one's not a success. Poppycock, boulder dash, funny crap. And every other Christian curse word, like he said, they're just not. It's not true. It's just not true. Yeah. So, so even within reformed circles, this is unique. Is that? Is that what it's not mean? unique, but not it's unique. not considered enough. Not maybe, unique, maybe not the right word. It's not considered enough. It's not pressed enough. Van Til was its champion because he was a presuppositional thinker. He did what I was talking about last night. He went to the spirit of your mind, the attitude of your mind. I want to talk to you about the thinking under your thinking. Mm -hmm. right. And it drove you crazy when you were in his lectures. Because you always wanted to say, teach me how to think. He said, no. I'm going to teach you what should be the thinking under your thinking. I kept, you know, the phrase Dr. Frame, Mr. Frame used to say, he said, you all want us to fill your bucket. We won't do it. We're going to give you a blueprint for a shovel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you're like, I'm not paying you money to do that. <laughs> I want you just to fill this thing. I came here, um, you know, make me Francis Schaefer quickly. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's all I want. And this answers so many things, too. I mean, I, I love the answer. I actually just used this last week. Uh, the answer this gives to the kid in the youth group who comes and says, how is it not selfish for God to demand him that he alone be glorified? And when you look at the Trinity... It's not one person like Allah saying, glorify me. It's always the Father giving glory to the Son, and the Son yeah. giving glory to the Father. Yeah. And, and, you, and you see it, um, 
in various, just before the cross, Christ, just before he's to go to the cross, he says, now, Father, glorify your son. By taking me out. <laughs> yeah. It's just, whoa. The, the, the references, the high priestly prayer of Jesus will just explode in your face like a ping pong with stolen money. Mm -hmm. You just start seeing, this is why love communicates the gospel to the world. And the world will know that you sent me by the way they love one another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it'll take the whole high priestly prayer of Christ and and just the penny will drop, the other shoe will drop, and you'll start to see, this is why he prayed that way. And this is why love is so central and hate is so harmful. And, um, are, there, are there some key, um, key passages of scripture you would say that would be helpful in considering? If you just spent the next year in Genesis 1 through 3 and John 17, you, you'd do fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those would be two. And then other well, more. Those would be the greatest places to marry. Yeah. I think it also unifies so much from I mean, one, it when you start I remember about the curve in that glory means weight. It's what the word means. I mean, was it Kabat Kabat? Kabat or Kabo, depending yeah. upon now. <coughs> okay. And 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 this is what, and you know, you think of verses like the light of momentary, working eternal ways mm -hmm. and glory. There's such a weightiness to this to me that I've never, I mean, all these years, what have I been doing? You know, and I think about my own, in the best sense of the term, my own piety in the light of this, and it's just totally, I mean, that, that is, that's, it's integrative of everything. You know, and my, my ministry to my children, to my youth, to the people in my church, to my community, wherever I am, it's so much more meaningful yeah. to me. And it's, I mean, it's so much, I can't. I just can't. It's just mind blowing. <laughs> no, piety, you're, why does God want relational connection? Why, yeah. why is union with Christ right. important? You know, all these things have. Trinitarian smell to them. And mm -hmm. you say, oh, I see why these ideas of the line between you and me blurring are important to you. Um, that this, this property that is in you is to be the benefit of me. So you're, you're getting you're getting it. Paul Miller talks about that in his book Crying Life when he talks about Jesus answering. He can never answer. Like Jesus, like you know, he said, "How how are you? How are you doing in the ministry?" And he said, "You know, said, Father and I are fine. Father and I are fine." And it's like, but no, I'm talking about you. That doesn't compute. He couldn't answer you without referring to his Father and the Spirit. Yeah. You couldn't ask him, "How are you?" Alone, it just wouldn't even be part of this framework of thinking. Yeah. And um, that's so aberrant to us. Yeah. To think so connected. But he always did. Always. And um Thank you for sharing that. That's that's all that's a revolution. Wow. <laughs> it also ties into why your heart was so touched at the loss of your child. Yeah. It's it's not simply sadness. Yeah. It's not simply what? Sadness. Oh okay. yeah. You're not failing. You're feeling the way a father supposed to feel because of the tremendous weight that God has given inside the family. So the loss of life of the child is there are ways in which you now know the heart of God at the crucifixion that none of us will ever understand were we not to lose a child. We can't touch it. And to think if you feel what you feel that he made this universe knowing I'm going to take my son out and I'm going to make people that are going to require by my will the death of my son so they can be with us. Mm -hmm. oh. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. That's why when Revelation 13.8 says 
When was he crucified? Our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, crucified before the foundation of the world. Let's pray. We have touched on the infinite and have just skimmed the surface of the iceberg. Thank you for wanting us to know you and then giving us this privilege of playing the music of the Trinity for the whole world. As someone as well said, our doing that kind of music is music only a father could love. <laughs> <laughs> and the amazing thing is, you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving us this privilege. In Jesus' name. And how, how do you refer to that whole topic? Um, what, is there a, if you were going to, if you're looking for that in Genesis 1, 2, 3, and John 17, you're, what, is there, is, is there a, is there a distinction of that? No, I don't think there's anything beyond Trinitarian theology. So one of the, one of the first places that I really came across that being really reflective, I thought about it a little bit in seminary, but I don't know if you know, your church has done the Truth Project yet. We haven't. It's really.